Good morning, everyone from Washington, D.C., and a warm welcome from the Africa Center to everyone taking part in today's webinar, Taking Stock of African Peace Operations, the African Union-led Regional Task Force Against the Lord Resistance Army. And it's good to see a lot of familiar faces, and let me just commend everyone in the audience on the diversity of experience and expertise we have represented today. We have around 300 participants registered for today's webinar, representing military and civilians, uh, academics and ex experts, civil society, men, women from over 60, or nearly over 60 English speaking, Francophone, Arabic and Lusophone countries in Africa. So really, really impressive uh, registration and attendance for today's webinar. And even though we aren't able to be with you in person, um, we deeply value your continued participation and engagement and look forward to hopefully resuming uh, on the continent programming soon. Uh, my name is Dr. Nate Allen. I'm Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. I'm the Africa Center's faculty lead on peace operations. And it is my honor to serve as the moderator for today's panel. Um, this is the fourth and final in a series of webinars we've convened to discuss the strategic successes, challenges, and lessons learned from the African Regional P for the African Recent Regional Security Architecture from African Union authorized ad hoc regional missions. And before we continue to introduce the topic and our participants, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Dan Hampton, the acting director of the Africa Center, to say a few words. Dan. Thank you very much, Dr. Allen, and good afternoon. Uh, good morning, everyone, wherever you're dialing in from. And let me please start by offering a, a warm welcome and just thanking you all for taking the time to participate in this important webinar with us today. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you sharing some of it with us. As Dr. Allen mentioned, my name is Daniel Hampton. I'm the, uh, currently the acting director at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I know many of you dialed in today are alumni of the center. Uh, thanks for returning and being with us and our familiar faces and family. And maybe we have some new people as well. So allow me to just briefly say a few words about who we are at the Africa Center and what we do. So the Africa Center for Strategic Studies was founded in 1999 by our Congress, by the US Congress, for the study of security issues relating to Africa and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. We've developed a mission statement to address that mandate. And our mission statement is to advance African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships and catalyzing strategic solutions. And how we advance that mission is through three main pillars within our organization. The first is our academic affairs section and programs that we do, like the one that you're participating in with us today. Secondly, we have our research and strategic communications department. And if you're not familiar with the Africa Center website, africacenter.org, I strongly encourage you to make it a regular stop and a resource for you. We post all of our publications on that site in French and English, and some in Portuguese and Arabic, in PDF format, free and downloadable. We have a wealth of resources. We do spotlight pieces, infographics. Uh, and if you don't subscribe to our daily media review, there's an option to click on the website and do that as well. But please, I encourage you to make the africacenter.org website your friend and your resource. And then our last pillar is our community alumni affairs and our outreach and engagement section. And that's staying connected to people like you, our friends and our family, our community of interest who share our passion for African security issues. We wanna stay in contact with you. We wanna make the Africa Center a resource for you and make you feel like you're part of our family. Lastly, if you remember in the mission statement, the last sentence I said was catalyzing strategic solutions. And that's really all about you. We take these important issues, we bring in the experts, our panelists that you're gonna hear from today, and we share it. And we're hoping that you within your institution and the jobs you have, that you take this information and make it one small part of what you do so that we can catalyze strategic solutions and improve security on the African continent. So thank you very much for being with us today and doing that. This is an important topic. 
The African Union has taken a lead role in peace support operations on the continent. And it's very important that we look at case studies such as this and the lessons learned that we have, because that situation is not going to change. The African Union's role in peace support operations on the continent is critically important. So I'm very happy that we have our distinguished panelists with us today to dissect and look at this issue more closely. So Dr. Allen, thank you very much for pulling this all together. Uh, back over to you. Thank you very much, Jan. And that's a perfect transition into introducing the content and themes of today's webinar. So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, this is the fourth and final in a series of webinars we're, we're, we're conducting on peace operations known as African Union Authorized Ad Hoc Security Initiatives. Um, they are coalitions of regional actors that have come together to respond to shared security threats and challenges. They have each received, requested, received, and requested and received authorization from the African Union, but they operate outside of the official framework of the regional economic communities and regional mechanisms like the ANBI, the African Standby Force. They're medium-sized missions. They have between 5,000 and 10,000 authorized troops apiece, and they include first the G5's held joint force, which we had a webinar on back in April. Second, the Lake Chad Basin's multinational joint task force, which we discussed in September. And finally, the African Union-led regional task force against the Lord Resistance Army, or the AURTF, which was the African Union's first authorized peace operation and our topic of discussion today. In July 2011, the African Union authorized the creation of the AURTF as part of the broader regional coordination initiative to counter the Lord Resistance Army. The mandate of the AURTF was to coordinate the actions of approximately 5,000 regional troops responding to an expansion of the LRA. The troop contributing countries included approximately 40% of troops from Uganda, where the LRA insurgency had historically been most active, with other troop contributing countries, including uh, Sudan, South Sudan, the Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, each of whom had been affected by the LRA's recent expansion. The European Union and the United States also provided financial, financial and military support somewhat more modestly. And between 2011 and 2017, the year that the US and Uganda withdrew most of their support from the operation, it is widely credited with helping to significantly reduce the scope and the scale of the threat from the LRA. Now that nearly five years have passed since the height of regional efforts to contain the LRA, this is an excellent opportunity to take stock with the benefit of hindsight of what were the main successes and challenges? How has the AURTF uh, informed the development of African-led approaches and uh, to, to peacekeeping and conflict management across the continent? To what extent did the AURTF achieve its objectives? And to what extent does the LRA still pose a threat? And I think most importantly for our many in the audience here, what lessons are there to be learned from the LRA for the future of the African regional and security architecture? Uh, to help shed light on these important questions, we've composed a truly all-star panel uh, composed of leading experts, uh, former AU officials and academics who have worked collectively on the LRA for many, many decades. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, so I will keep my introduction brief. Um, first, we have uh, Minister Betty Bagambe, who was the former Senior Director for Fragility, Conflict, and Violence at the World Bank Group, as well as a member of the Ugandan Cabinet and Parliament. She is an internationally respected mediator who has played a key role in negotiation efforts to contain the LRA. Next, we have Dr. Jide Martens Okeke, who is the regional co the coordinator for regional programs for Africa at the UNDP. For over a decade, he served as a peace and security expert, working for leading think tanks, academic and regional institutions, including the Harvard Kennedy School and the African Union Commission, where he served as head of policy on peace operations from 2014 to 2017. Finally, we have Dr. Christopher Day, who is Associate Professor at the Charleston College Department of Political Science. He is an expert on peace and security in Africa and has conducted extensive field work in Uganda. He is the co-author of an excellent Peace in Today's Readings on AU's regional task forces. So Betty, we're gonna start with you. Um, 
Given your experience as a, a Ugandan minister and, and deep involvement in efforts to address the LRA, I'd like you to help us understand a little bit about the political and strategic context that led to the AURTF's establishment. How did the AURTF come into being and who were the key actors involved in its creation? What was Uganda's role uh, in the creation and management of the AURTF? Uh, I'll start by saying that uh, what AURTF, the performance of a AURTF could be emulated elsewhere in Africa. I will also look at why did it take 23 years for the AU forces to intervene um, in the LRA uh, war. This, this was triggered by the fact that it became a regional problem. The fact that in that LRA uh, was in South Sudan, which they had been for a long time. Uh, then after the Juba peace talks failed, they went into Central African Republic. They went into uh, DR Congo. And at the same time, that what also attracted international uh, attention a lot was the fact that, was, was the fact that LRA had been indicted. And therefore, when the, 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 the leader of LRA failed or refused to show up to sign the agreement that had been negotiated in Juba after a series of other negotiations, um, of which two were initiated by me, uh, that there was concern not just within AU, but also internationally, that the LRA has to be, the issue has to be addressed by region. And it should no longer be the Ugandan uh, problem alone. And consequently, AU in uh, August 2009 decided that something has to, had to be done by AU. A series of meetings took place and finally, uh, November 2011, decision, a bold decision was taken that AU forces contributed by the regions, that is Uganda, Congo, um, Congo, South Sudan, and Central African Republic have to jointly fight um, um, LRA uh, because they'd become a menace. Of course, they were carrying out their heinous crimes they were uh, abducting people and killing and conducting a lot of destructions. And EU uh, came in to support the effort. Uh, United States came in a little later to contribute 100 forces. Uh, UA, uh, and therefore, once this decision was taken, there were four components of the decision. One was the formation of the AURTF forces. The second one was appointment of a uh, uh, representative of the AU to the LRA issue. The other one was formation of uh, the headquarters, which was in Obo in Central African uh, Republic. And, uh, and then uh, the third one was also use other non-military approach to encourage defection. Uh, yeah, the forces were contributed. They were expected to be 5,000, but ultimately there were only 3,500. Of the 3,500, 2,000 were contributed by uh, Uganda. And uh, this, uh, then of course, United States came in. Uh, before I go into the successes and the challenges, I want to say that uh, uh, successes and challenges of the intervention of AURTF force is that um, there were quite a number of issues to get over. Uh, uh, in that South Sudan had just become semi-autonomous uh, after this after signing of the CBA, and therefore their forces were not quite in place yet. Then there was DRC, uh, DRC had to be persuaded. Then there was Central African Republic, which also had been unstable. So 
and then, of course, Uganda, which was perceived as the exporter of the problem, took the bigger role of, um, of addressing the LRA issue. Why I'm saying it, it can be emulated in other countries is that the support that poured in once AU took this bold decision that there must be intervention, intervention to stop uh, LRA activities in the sub-region. And uh, United States came in and contributed the forces. This is a very good example of regional forces coming together to address a problem within the region and uh, notwithstanding other challenges like, uh, you know, you have the Francophone with their culture and the, the Anglophone with their culture and um, different kind of trainings, bring, putting up a structure that could collectively address the problem. Uh, it is also impressive in the, in, in the sense that they overcame the language barrier and other issues and were able to uh, collectively address uh, the problem. So that said, uh, and let, uh, should, I also want to suggest that I've written a paper, which I'll be very happy to share. I'll send it to you, Alan, I mean, Nate, uh, so that it can be broadly shared. But thank you so much, and we really do. Do we send us that paper, we'll get it, make sure we get it on our website so that not only I, but all of our, our audience members and, and alumni community can, can do the paper. But, but you've done a really, really good job, I think, of, of summarizing uh, how and why the AURTF came into being. And specifically, you figured this important coordinating and convening role that the African Union played. And, and I'd like Jide, um, who has worked for the AU in the past and written and thought about regional institutions and regional architecture in Africa very, very extensively, um, to come in here. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit more from your view, uh, Jide, what was the AU's role in the establishment and, implement, and implementation of the AURTF? And how, how was the way that the AU approached the uh, regional task force uh, different from how it might have approached previous and more traditional AU sponsored peace operations? Thank you very much, Nate, uh, for having me and uh, good morning and good afternoon to colleagues. I think in addressing your, your question, uh, I would want to explain why I consider to be, uh, what I consider to be the first uh, in this model called the Regional Task Force Against the LRA. And, and I would want to provide you with just five key points. Uh, the first uh, is that when you think about the RTF, uh, it will be hard not to come to the conclusion that it represents the first empirical distinction between what we refer to as uh, authorized uh, versus uh, mandated AUP support operations. And this was where we really saw that distinction being implemented. When we think about uh, authorized missions, which the RTF was, uh, what you would find in terms of the operational structure is that there was no uh, command and control responsibility on the African Union. Uh, and so the African Union therefore uh, played a coordination role and also helped galvanize resources uh, in terms of uh, the deployment of uh, the RTF. Uh, the second lesson, which I think is really profound uh, in, in thinking about the RTF is that the, the RT, RTF for, for many reasons uh, became the first ever ad hoc coalition against uh, what was considered to be a, an armed opposition or terrorist group. And that is very clear from its mandate. Uh, and, and this was the first time uh, that the African Union was authorizing, not necessarily mandating, because it had mandated AMISOM in 2007, but it was authorizing an ad hoc coalition uh, and providing that ad hoc coalition with the political legitimacy uh, to conduct high intensity operations. Uh, you know, this is something that became, and we can talk about the lessons later, but it has continued to define how uh, we think about uh, the future of Africa-led peace support operations uh, on the African continent. The, the, the third lesson, which, uh, which is also important to highlight, 
is that the RTF was the first light deployment uh, of high intensity operations. And what do I mean by this? I think uh, uh, Madam Bigombe made the point uh, earlier. If you think about the RTF in comparison with a similar mission that is mandated by the African Union to conduct high intensity operation, usually what you would find is that the first threat uh, is usually very high. Uh, so if you think about Amazon, for instance, where it was mandated and over time, it, uh, the first strength of Amazon became over 20,000 20, uniformed personnel. This was a light mission in the sense that there were just, it was mandated to deploy 5,000 uh, uh, military personnel, not in fact uniformed personnel, because that's a, there's a distinction there. And in the end, uh, the first generation percentage in terms of first gener generation that was attained was just slightly over 50%. Uh, and, and the bulk of the forces were from uh, the UPDF. So, so and, and this is a challenge because in, in missions such as this where high intensity operation is, is required, uh, first generation is always a challenge. Uh, and we see that in some of the missions that have been deployed uh, since then. The last two points I, I would like to mention is the financing option. Um, what the RTF did was to help us think about the financing models uh, that could emerge when we have authorized Africa-led peace operations. Uh, and so because there, it is not mandated uh, by the AU, but rather it is uh, neither is it mandated by the UN Security Council, what the RTF was able to benefit from was that it was able to be benefit from a voluntary contribution from partners. And, and the point that has already been made uh, is that we had the United Nations, uh, the United States uh, providing uh, logistics, intelligence, training, equipment, tactical airlift, and the rest, whilst the EU uh, provided funding uh, to the Joint uh, Coordination Mechanism Secretariat. So you can see that uh, when when you mandate uh, versus when you authorize a mission, there are certain responsibilities uh, that are possible and those that are not. Uh, so this was something that was based on the deployment of voluntary financial contribution from partners. Uh, and the last point is around exit. Um, this is probably the most important point because oftentimes, and I've heard this uh, in the last two interventions, that the RTF was, was liquidated. Indeed, the RTF has been liquidated, but the approach in which it was liquidated is one that ha uh, has implication for how we do peace operations. Uh, uh, if you recall, uh, the Peace and Security Council of the African Union in 2018, uh, did call for um, an open-ended extension of the RTF. Notwithstanding, uh, on the ground, what we saw was that the RTF headquarters in Yambio had been closed uh, from 2017 and was not re-established. Uh, so it was not necessarily a smooth uh, uh, exit strategy. And today, uh, when we uh, talk about exit strategy within the context of peace support operation, the question still remains as to whether we would want to think about exit strategy in terms of uh, um, condition-based exit or time-bound or a combination of the two. Uh, I'll stop there and I, I can return back to some of the lessons uh, later. Back to you, Nate. No, thanks, Chide. That was an excellent response. I think you really made clear how between having a light footprint having the mission be African Union authorized, which meaning that meaning that there was no command and control, but not mandated like other missions, um, and, and having having really the AU's role be coordinating rather than convening, um, and, and having having such a light footprint made this made this operation really different from what had come before, um, and has really shaped, as you said, I think, a lot of how the AU approaches peace operations now. Um, so I'd like to bring you Chris in now to help us unpack how we can understand the regional attack forces, maybe from a broader conflict management perspective. Um, you know, people often, I think, struggle to, to categorize the regional task forces. Uh, sometimes it's categorized as a peace operation. Other scholars prefer to, prefer to use the term ad hoc regional coalitions or regional security initiatives. But in your view, how does the design and implementation of the AURTF um, compare to more traditional peacekeeping missions that, 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 that Gide discussed and Gide mentioned Somalia, for example. So what are the key similarities and, and differences, if you could unpack those a little bit further? 
Yes, yeah, so, well, first of all, good morning and uh, thanks, Nate, for putting this together and congratulations and on putting and pulling this off. Um, just a quick note, um, when you were introducing the panel, um, I'm sitting here in my kitchen, my teenage son was getting ready to go to school and he turned to me and he said, wow, those are really impressive sounding people. They're way more impressive than you. So uh, kudos to Gide and Betty for making me look good in front of my son. Um, so in terms of uh, similarities and differences, there's, I'm going to highlight one similarity and, and three differences. Um, the first similarity, in my view, is that um, these are normatively legitimized operations, which, is a, which signals a major normative shift within the African regional political context. So in the old days, you know, you had this very, very strict norm of non-intervention, non-interference in each other's affairs. But since um, the African Union came online 20 years ago, uh, there's been this steady march towards the creation of this uh, APSA, the African Peace and Security Architecture. And so uh, this, this is really sort of, uh, sort of the sharp end of this normative shift where now the African Union has these legitimate normative grounds to interfere in the affairs of other countries, but it's legitimized. Right through this major shift, and it's, it's very, very interesting. I think because, um, like back in the old days, you could fall backwards into an executive mansion as a as a in, in the middle of a coup, and then be recognized as the president by the rest of the the, the continent. But now, um, there's there's more strict rules about um, what constitutes, for example, ways to seize power, but also um, the norm of non-interference has now shifted to this norm of non-indifference. But the, the AU task force is now a norm of, of robust intervention. So that brings me to the main key difference is that um, this, these are not traditional peacekeeping or peace building or peace operations at all. You know, traditional peacekeeping missions, they're um, multi-headed hydras, they're, 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 they have multiple moving parts. Uh, so for example, um, their main role is usually in monitoring uh, peace accords and that's the that's that's the inception um and you know they've gone over they've, they've undergone major transformations over the last 20 years um now we see sort of the era of robust peacekeeping where they've shifted away from being neutral with light military equipment only using force and self-defense um, now they're verifying peace accords they're in investigating monitoring ceasefire viol violations they're preventatively deploying almost acting like police forces within the countries where they deploy they do ddr that's a uh, demobilization de disarmament and reconstruction or rehabilitation sometimes they do mine clearance uh, they provide a secure environment and a lot of times they engage in humanitarian assistance and electoral support the task forces are combat missions. And that, that's what's the, the key distinction between these and traditional peacekeeping um, entities. You know, they're doing, they're, they're, they're man hunts. They're looking to apprehend or, or kill Joseph Kony and the top commanders of the LRA. Um, and so they're adopting more uh, counterinsurgency style strategies than you'd see from uh, peacekeeping operations. Um, another main difference, I think, you know, more if you zoom out a little bit and look at um, what they're responding to is that they're responding to what I would what I would describe as the changing nature of conflict in Africa more generally. So in the past, you have people going to the bush, taking up arms and trying to overthrow regimes or trying to trying to use rebellion to negotiate themselves um, back into a regime that maybe had thrown them out before. But now the the conflict dynamics of Africa have changed dramatically since the 1990s, where in the 1990s, as a region, um, Africa had the most conflicts in any region in the world. But that's actually declined um, relative to the Middle East, but also the nature of these armed groups. They're more uh, decentralized. They operate in the poorest border regions, um, like in CAR, Congo, Sudan, South Sudan, and in West Africa. And um, they don't necessarily have they don't, they don't have sort of identifiable political agendas. And so um, in this respect, the, the task forces are better equipped to deal with these actors um, that might be difficult to incorporate into political establishments in these states. Um, I don't 
think that there was any real meaning, maybe perhaps Betty can correct me on this, but I don't know if there was any really meaningful attempt to incorporate Joseph Kony and the LRA into the, the, the NRA regime in Uganda. I don't know, you're gonna make a ministry of, Minister of Tourism or something. I'm not sure if that was ever a plan, but those are the, that's, that's the role of traditional peace building um, operations. And then um, finally, I'd say that um, the main difference is that the, the task forces are really useful instruments for regimes to pursue their regional security interests that's, that are not watered down or diluted by larger multinational interventions. So for example, um, the UPDF and the Ugandan regime, uh, the, Museveni, I think he likes to fancy himself as sort of like a regional musée, like he likes to ha have a large regional security footprint for whatever reasons, it could be personal, it could be um, for his regime security or maybe economic. But these types of arrangements allow regimes like the one in Uganda to intervene more directly um, and have a lot more strategic autonomy over the decisions that they make um, in these combat missions um, with a lot less accountability and a lot less oversight. Um, so that's, I would say, um, the three main distinctions. Thank you. No, thank you very, very much, Chris. And I think you've made it very clear just how different these missions are from traditional peacekeeping operations, you know, from the focus on counterinsurgency rather than peace negotiation um, to having the really the, the focal points be the regional actors and conflict affected countries themselves as having command and control over these forces rather than, say, a big international body like the UN or the AU. So I think now the big question becomes, this has become in part because of the changing nature of conflict in Africa, a fairly well-established and accepted modality of intervention across the continent. We've seen it not just in the AURTF, but now with, with entities like the Multinational Joint Task Force in Nigeria, the G5 Sahel, the G, and the G5 Sahel. So what are, going back to what, what Betty was, was, was initially hinting at, what are the key successes, challenges, and lessons learned from the AURTF, and how can that inform, and how is that informing uh, conflict management efforts across the continent? So Betty, let's let's go to you first. Um, what contributions did the AURTF make in containing the threat from the Lord Resistance Army in your view, and what are the, some of the lessons learned for, for, for broader conflict management efforts across the continent? Yeah, uh, because this intervention, the AURTF intervention, it was not militarily alone. Uh, there, there was the component to encourage defection. And actually that had a big impact, impact in the sense that quite a number of uh, LRA commanders defected, including Dominic Ongwen, who is today uh, is in The Hague, who is waiting to be uh, convicted. But, uh, some, I was looking at the chat very, very quickly, and uh, there were some people who were asking, it did not have an impact immediately. True, it did not. Uh, I have the data here in the paper that I'll give you how uh, increasingly the LRA reduced in number and how their activities were reduced, including abduction uh, of people, uh, not just children. Uh, how it, it, it decreased over a period of time. Oh, and the beauty of these two is that the synergies, because it involved NGOs, UN was there, UN OCHA, and uh, of course the Security Council, and EU, and EU. So this kind of synergy has a very positive impact on had a very positive impact on pursuing the LRA to the level that they were reduced. But let's say some of the challenges were resources. Uh, the, the decision was taken to, for the operation to start, but we need to look at the time it took before resources were available uh, to enable the activities to start. Could we do better? Could the international community, could AU do better if such a decision, if such intervention has to take place in future, that it does not take so long for resources uh, to be available because announcement was made and therefore you, LRA went into a panic 
a panic, but after some time, after the, uh, uh, quite a bit of time lapsed, they realized nothing was going to happen. So by the time the actual operation started, um, they had gained momentum again. So these are some of the lessons that we need to learn, uh, take into consideration that such a decision, when, once it's taken, it should be implemented uh, in a, a timely manner uh, so that uh, uh, I, I, I strongly feel that if this was done early enough, uh, probably uh, LRA would have been history much, much earlier. And the suffering that took place until 2015, 2016, uh, probably would have ended uh, much, uh, much, much earlier. There's no doubt about it that the impact is huge. Today, we have not captured Joseph Cohn, but nobody knows where he is. Nobody knows, no, not very many people are aware of their activities. Once in a while you hear something, but that is because of the RTF intervention in pursuing the LRA, because LRA suddenly realized it was not just Uganda, but the entire region um, had combined to fight them. So uh, uh, the impact has been huge. And uh, as a result, life, normal life has resumed in some of the countries that had been affected. You don't hear about them in South Sudan anymore, not in DRC. Occasionally between um, Central African Republic and the full, occasionally you hear of one or two activities. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. And I think you actually made a really interesting point that um, about how one of the main focuses of the CLRA was, was not just to kind of liquidate the leaders, but also to encourage defections among yeah. senior leaders and group members, which is something I know that, that the MNJTF has, has also taken. And what strikes me about that is that it's interesting because the, the um, regional task forces often get criticized for uh, being strongly focused on a military strategy. Although what strikes me is that encouraging defections is also to some degree a bit of a, 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 an understanding in order for the conflict and you have to encourage defections. You can't just eliminate the threat. So, so there is a little bit of a non-civilian component to, to that strategy, which, which might help explain to some, some degree, some, some of the ways in which they helped attenuate the strength of the LRA over the time that, that there was operations were at their peak. But I, I'd really like to get the, the take of, of the other panelists on some of the successes, challenges, and, and, and failures. So Chris, I'm going to go back to you, and I'd, I'd like you to address uh, the same question I asked to Betty, but maybe with more of a, a social science perspective. Um, what do you think are the key lessons learned from the AURTF for the management of other conflicts? And in your view, are there are there what aspects are, are replicable versus what aspects of the AURTF um, might be difficult to replicate? Are there are there any components that maybe were a product of the particular actors involved, place, and, and time? So, Chris, over to you. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so I have a bunch of things I want to say, <laughs> actually. So please signal me when I've rambled on too much. Um, so after our conversation, we had a little brief conversation, a test run the other morning. I I went ahead and I went to the LRA crisis tracker, you know, this thing that's run by invisible children. And it, it had been a while since I'd, I'd taken a look at it. And, um, and, and Betty is right. I mean, the LRA are basically, well, I mean, they're not, they're not a threat anymore from a conventional military perspective. You know, they, they're just one of several actors that are roving around Eastern DRC and um, Eastern CAR um, looting and, and, and robbing people and then letting them go. You know, so um, they're basically done. Um, I, you know, I, the, the rumor is that Joseph Kony is in the Kafi Akinji region um, of Sudan on the border of CAR in South Sudan. Um, if everyone knows that, it's been always been a puzzle to me why he can't be apprehended. But um, the LRA is basically done um, from a from a conventional viewpoint. Um, the big question is, you know, whether or not the RTF can be viewed as successful. Um, in light of the LRA being sort of a spent force. And probably um, Betty's partially right that they brought to bear a lot of force. Um, there was a lot of communication with people on the ground and um, people actors on the ground. But I wonder if the LRA was already 
ready to crumble by the time the, the RTF was, was deployed. This is an organization that had declined since its height of operational effectiveness in the 1990s and again in the early 2000s when they were still getting some support from the Sudanese government where they were getting, not only were they getting arms and territory, but they were also learning how to adapt in the absence of arms and support. Um, sometimes the cartoon would cut off the faucet of support to the LRA and then they, they learned how to adapt in these bush environments and um, live off the land and, and preserve their energy for, for fights. But what they were really good at is um, figuring out the geopolitics of the region and leaving zones where um, state institutions were starting to assert themselves. So they started off in northern Uganda in the late 80s, early 90s, when state institutions weren't that robust. They moved to South Sudan after the peace agreement in 2005, um, the CPA. The South Sudan autonomous government started to assert itself, and so they moved to Congo, and then the RTF, well, the, the Uganda military started to, to hunt them, and then the RTF actually started to close that space, that, that space of, uh, sort of where government institutions are weak or absent. So I would say that the RTF might have been sort of a substitute, like a military substitute for these state institutions where, because the ILRA always thrives in environments where there's no state institutions. So it was sort of like an artificial imposition um, through force um, that scattered them and made them have to go on the run and between all these different countries. But at the same time, the internal organization of the LRA had also eroded over time. Um, lots of people defected um, in part because of the RTF, but some of the top commanders around Joseph Kony that allowed to have them uh, this, this sort of organizational cohesion started to unravel once they started to go on the move in these other countries. So maybe they didn't need that much of a push uh, to unravel, but these are, these are open questions that um, we, can, we can research. So the other things I would say, like sort of from uh, the observations that I've made, just open policy questions, so not necessarily social science questions. Um, one is I've always been curious about the coordination between the armed forces that um, constitute these task forces. You know, how, how good was it? Um, my anecdotal conversations with members of the UPDF suggests that, um, you know, they're obviously the, the dominant force, but um, there was not a lot of um, uh, positive coordination between uh, other partners. There were some, some rifts and some maybe some personality disputes. Um, the other interesting policy implication is, you know, another anecdotal observation I made is that when the US military was really in support of the, the task force based in Entebbe, you had a lot of interaction between trainers from the United States and UPDF officers and soldiers. And this speaks to a broader pattern of foreign training of African armies, right? This idea that foreign training helps professionalize these militaries, makes them more effective, more efficient, um, certainly gives them logistical support. Um, and the idea is that it, it helps sort of realize this more traditional civil military relations arrangement, right? Where the military is over here, is it, there's objective civilian control. But I wonder if that's pos ever possible in a country like Uganda, where the military in, in many respects is sort of a, a, the armed wing of the dominant political party. And so when you start giving them all sorts of training and they're professionalizing, but not as a counterweight to regime authority, but as an accelerant to regime authority. So that's something to, to discuss as well. The, the implications of these task forces when they would rely on outside resources and training from governments like the United States. And a third um, policy implication is, uh, um, how do we know when these things are done? Um, so the RTF sort of kind of ran out of steam on its own. The US pulled the plug on its support and then the Ugandans decided, I guess they didn't want to do it anymore. So what's the tipping point where we know then the RTFs, or the, the task forces need to be terminated? Is it when they're the, the bad guys are apprehended or killed or is it these other external circumstances where people get tired of it? And um, what do you do when the contributing countries um, when the interests of the regime um, burns out. And um, that's an open question as well. And finally, to, to address uh, Nate's um, demand that I be social scientist, 
Um, this, I'm going to say something kind of maybe um, controversial from a scholarly point of view, but um, it has to do with um, you know what functions these task forces um, have in terms of regime security. So back in the old days, in the particular in the 1990s, when the the norm of non-interference was actually starting to unravel after the Cold War, and you saw this big spike of regional conflicts, regional conflict systems like in the Horn of Africa with Sudan at the middle, Congo with Rwanda, Uganda and Congo and all these other regional actors. And then in West Africa with Liberia at the, at the middle of this regional conflict, it was very, very common for regimes to arm groups in neighboring countries to pr pursue whatever interests they had clandestinely. So the LRA was a client of Sudan, the SPLA was supported by Uganda. There's this whole kaleidoscope of, of proxy wars happening. And then after the African Union came online, there's this dramatic decline in proxy warfare, either through normative shifts or, or maybe something else. So the open question I have is, that, is this, did the task forces allow regimes to pursue, pursue like a new form of proxy warfare regionally um, under the legitimization of the AU umbrella? Right. So is this business as usual as regimes pursue their security interests? But now, because the norms have shifted in the favor of, of regimes rehatting themselves, no longer are they supporting armed groups in neighboring countries. Now they can send their own armies um, legitimately um, with the blessing of not only the AU, but the international community as well. So I'll leave those open questions for discussion. Thanks. Thanks. That was an awful but a lot of great points, a lot to chew on. I think what, what really struck me was this whole question of, of end games. It's kind of a little bit of a, a parallel to, to Jide talking about how it can be difficult for to end some of these groups. And one of the main reasons is because it's difficult to know when uh, the insurgency is ended or when the threat has eroded. That's actually very, very common in insurgencies. I believe most insurgencies you know, especially the kind we see today don't end with some kind of peace negotiation. They end when um, armed groups that have taken part of the insurgency fade into irrelevance, sort of like what we've seen with the LRA, although maybe there's some, some minute level of threat. Um, so, so, and I think that makes the job of the regional organizations and actors who are intervening harder. They have to judge whether or not this actor is likely to be a threat or is on a kind of trajectory of permanent decline. And it's not obvious you know, in the, in the moment when that's happening, which is part of why we're having this discussion now, sort of five years after the fact. So Jide, um, we'll conclude with you. I, I think we have a lot of, lot of uh, audience questions. If you have a question, I would encourage you to ask it in the chat now. We'll begin asking uh, our panelists after Jide gets some, a final word in so. So start those questions. And Jide, do you agree with what Chris and Betty have laid out? Does anything they said resonate with you? Um, what, in your view, are the key lessons learned from the AURTF for the effective management of peace operations or other kinds of interventions by the AU, uh, regional actors, or the UN? No, thank you. Thank you very much, Nate. Very, very important uh, intervention so far. Uh, and most of what I would say would align with uh, what has been said already. I think if the first point, which uh, if one thinks about uh, Africa peace support operations today, uh, and you make that connection with the RTF, it would be, you might most likely come with to the con consensus that ad hoc coalitions are here to stay, given the nature of the dynamic sec security threats that uh, the continent faces. And, and, and that is why uh, if one looks at uh, some of the models that have been deployed uh, since 2011, uh, there you would most likely also conclude that uh, some of these new missions have been inspired by uh, the RTF model. Uh, so if you're thinking about the MNJTF against Boko Haram or the G5 Sahel. Uh, uh, and in fact, also uh, to some extent, and I know this is not something that has been discussed because it's quite recent, the, the recent deployment of Rwanda in the Cabo Delgado region, uh, right? Uh, that is based on a bilateral partnership, but it's also a, a coalition between states uh, that are uh, uh, seeking to uh, reduce the security threat posed by uh, a particular uh, opposition group. So that model is, is here to stay in many ways. Uh, and I, I do think that as we deploy uh, them, uh, they would 
uh, hopefully be enhanced in terms of their operational efficiency. But what is more important to note is that, and if you think about the fact that there are still security challenges in, in the region today, um, the RTF does put a spotlight on, on the need, on the question around governing borderland communities. Uh, and and if, you, if you look at the geographical location where uh, some of these ad hoc coalitions are deployed, they are all deployed around borderland communities, so borders. Uh, so be it in the case of the RTF, or if you think about the Lake Chad Basin uh, against Boko Haram and, and the areas or the sectors of operations there, or in fact, the G5 Sahel, uh, the commonalities are around this different context is this question around insecurity in borders. What can we do about that? Uh, and if borderland communities do constitute 2000, uh, 270 million uh, in terms of their population across the continent, it is important that a spotlight has to be uh, uh, put on how we are able to manage the question around governance in borderland communities. And, and this is really important for sustainable solutions to peace. And, and related to this point is that, you know, hard security interventions, as we have seen in the case of RTF, could enable and, and certainly could en enable conditions for, for peace, but they are inherently not uh, the uh, means through which peace will be achieved. And, and, and therefore, it is important to complement hard security interventions with, with soft security interventions. And, and we are seeing that when the RTF was established, there wasn't real, any real thinking around the political strategy that would inform that transition from you know, hard security intervention into um, uh, governance or in fact, soft security intervention. We have seen that being corrected uh, in the case of the Lake Chad uh, Basin, uh, where a political strategy, and in this case, uh, the regional stabilization strategy is informing the um, political engagement that would lay the conditions for sustainable peace. So in, in thinking about uh, the, the value uh, proposition of ad hoc coalition, you should not discount the imperative uh, for you know, a political strategy that is rooted in local ownership. The last point I want to make is that for so long, uh, we have been talking about the need to enable conditions for humanitarian assistance uh, in some of these uh, communities. It is important, but it is short term. I think the overall vision for security in these areas must be done in a way that it gives agency back to the people. Because if you're giving agency back to the people and not to uh, development agencies like us or, or to um, uh, the, the, the African Union, what it does is that you're able to achieve sustainable community security uh, in ways uh, that will promote a division for peace. Uh, those will be my initial interventions. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much uh, to Gide and to all the three of you for a really, really excellent plenary session. Lots and lots of insight. I think lots and lots of things uh, all of us can take away. I, I think I've learned a lot. Um, well, now going to begin the question and answer period. And I encourage your participants to please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. To, if you have not already, please submit your written questions to our panelists. Uh, you can submit your questions in any language you like. As moderator, I'll convey as many as my time will allow. We already have a number of really great questions. Um, so the first question, and building off of something you just said, Jida, we have a question that was meant for 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 Betty, but I think I think we can we can ask it to all of you. Is is um, what does the LRA inform us about? I think regionalized responses to some of the current and more recent uh, interventions, specifically looking at like the the SADC intervention or the Rwandan intervention in the conflict in, in Cabo Delgado region. So I, I I think it'd be curious from your perspective as to how the AURTF might have uh, informed the response to that conflict, maybe through increasing uh, role and influence of, of regional actors. Um, another question we have is, 
how does the role of the uh, African standby force fit in with the RTF? Um, another, another question we have is to, to Chris's earlier point, um, uh, who are really benefiting from these peace operations? Um, so I, I think the way I take that question is, you look at a lot of peace operations across the continent and the major truth, troop contributing countries are often, um, as, as Chris said, um, authoritarian regimes who kind of privilege regime security over citizen security and often will become involved in international conflicts to raise their profile, to, to, to increase the professionalism of their military forces in ways that secure their power uh, back at home. That's actually uh, a topic I'm, I'm interested in and, and, and something that, that I think we might potentially be doing uh, further programming on here at the Africa Center. So um, I'd love for um, each of the, the our panelists to respond to these questions so far. You can take any that you would like, um, and I'll go through the three of you. And I think maybe after that, we'll have time for one or two more rounds of questions. Um, Betty, let's let's start with you. Are there any of those questions you would like to address? Uh, well, like, uh, thank you. I just thought I would uh, take on the question of the role of standby. Um, process um, and and this is a topic that merits uh, further discussion because we hear of standby forces but it's always very very difficult to know when they can intervene and I also think the question of standby forces has been highly politicized to a point that uh, they really truly are standby and not active uh, enough. I hear about East African uh, standby forces, but exactly what the forces do, I do not understand. We have issues and problems and conflicts in the region. Uh, and sometimes I, sometimes, oftentimes I question, what are the standby forces for? Why are they not intervening? We hear about uh, lack of access to um, for humanitarian assistance. For example, let's give the example of South Sudan that you have, well, there's of course UNMIS, a uh, strong force in there, but even then we still have challenges having access just for humanitarian assistance to reach uh, the internally displaced. So is this something that, that standby forces could not contribute for uh, to? I just think uh, that it's important that the regional leaders uh, do not uh, establish the standby forces for the sake of doing so, because to emulate examples from other uh, regions, but, in, 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 but whatever they're established for should be in translated uh, into action. Um, but again, I, would, I want to confess and hear that I have not really quite studied uh, exactly what they do, what their mandates are, when they can get into, when they can uh, start any form of operation. Um, and uh, of course, a, a, a lot of times, the problems is resources that the contributing countries might not have the required resources. Like in the case of AURTF, uh, responsibilities of resources was distributed to the contributing countries, whereas uh, logis logistics and other uh, requirements were met by the UN, UN OCHA, and EU. So these are things that need to be defined and uh, put uh, into use. Let me just sidestep a little bit. We just had a meeting about two weeks, exactly two weeks ago on EGAD. And um, one leader was castigating them. Why are you not doing anything? People are dying in the region. Are you still alive or you're dead? And of course, the blame game started. Well, we cannot do anything without our heads of states authorizing us to move into action or facilitate us to, into doing something. So uh, a lot of these uh, standby forces 
we need to examine what the uses are and when they can swing into action. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, Chris, let's go to you. Okay, so thank you. So I think I'll take the first two questions together and then I'll talk to tackle the, the third question. So, um, so coming off of what Betty was saying about the African standby forces, you know, it's my impression that they're they're not quite operational, and um, it's it's unclear what they would actually look like if they ever became fully operational and how they would work politically. But I've heard, you know, one one person said to me a few years ago that the RTF um, was possible because of the it was a stopgap um, because of the absence of something like the uh, uh, African standby force. That if the ASF was actually up and running, that this is the type of operation that you'd expect them to. To launch, um, I'm not exactly sure that's that's correct. But the open question is what what kind of tasks would the ASF be expected to to carry out, and do combat missions and manhunts qualify as something within the remit? Maybe. Um, but one thing that we know, you know, coming off the first question, what does the RTF model tell us about the other models? Well, the other the other task forces were possible because the RTF came online. I was like, oh, we can do this. This is something we can do in the absence of alternatives. Um, and it seems that it serves many functions. So this goes to the third question, who benefits? Well, the African Union benefits because their peace and security architecture is actually being mobilized to address some sort of threat, but they're not quite on the hook for coordination and resourcing these operations like they'd normally be under some larger organization like like a peacekeeping force or even the African standby force. But getting back to what you were saying, Nate, about who benefits, well, there's some benefits that accrue to the regimes that are providing troops to these entities. And obviously they get some training, um, they get some financial support, and there's some sort of prestige involved in being part of these multinational forces. Um, and I think that's very important for some regimes, particularly like in Uganda and Rwanda, where their heads of state do like to fancy themselves as sort of the museums of the region, like I was saying before. But I do think there's an upward limit uh, to these benefits that once the soldiers in these armies start dying in the field, people start asking questions, not just within the military, but in you know broader uh, the broader public as well. It's like, what is the UPDF doing in Central African Republic? Um, sending home soldiers um, in body bags when our direct interest in fighting Joseph Kony is no longer really directly relevant to us because he's no longer operating in Uganda. And I think those conversations actually take place even within authoritarian regimes where there is some pushback from militaries that start to question the utility of their, their participation in these types of things. Um, now the LRA might be a particularly weird case because I think it, it, it might be personal. <laughs> I think there might be some people that just want to take Coney out at the top levels and they've evaded, he's evaded them for so long. I think they, there's like this sort of personal mission. Okay. This is our time. We're going to get them now. But um, even that has a limit as well because commanders get, they retire, they get cycled out by new commanders and the, the priorities of um, these sort of um, strategic thinkers in the military uh, change to more pressing concerns. Um, that are beyond this, these sort of diminished rebel groups that no longer pose a direct threat. So that's how I'd answer that. Thanks. Nate, Thanks. could I just jump in in there? I just wanted to... Sure, then we, uh, then we, then we go to Gita. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I want you to answer me about this. Uh, although the mandate of AU forces in Somalia is slightly different from that of LRA, but uh, you're talking only about the pre prestige of the countries and the benefits that accrue to them. What would Somalia be today without the AU forces? I just thought I could throw that in. Okay, so... Um, because it's, it's, to... I, I just thought your perspective is very much one-sided and not looking at uh, the benefits into the... Uh, yeah. To, to the country that is affected by conflict. Well, I mean, I think there's a big difference between Somalia and Eastern Congo and Eastern CAR. And the, there's a big difference between these two types of operations. So the, the question was about the RTF, 
not about um, Amisom. So if the question was about Amisom, you're right. I mean, um, Somalia is a lot better off than it was 10 years ago. There's a some level of stability and there's actually a functioning regime there. But at, responding directly to the question about who benefits from the RTF, um, it's unclear to me whether or not there's direct benefits um, to ordinary people living in Eastern Congo and CAR. And some, in fact, some people might even argue that militarizing these um, contexts even further with uh, task forces actually um, worsens the situation. Um, I don't know if there's any evidence about that, but um, that's something for, uh, for further discussion. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to go to GDA, but I'm actually going to come in on the, on, we have a question along those lines um, too. So I, and we were running a long time. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask these last two questions. I'm going to go to GDA and ask all of you to kind of, GDA can respond to what he wanted and the two of you can come in and, and, and conclude. So, so uh, we have one question that I think deals with uh, the, the financing, um, which is, um, you know, how, what kind of means does the AU have to kind of deal with with conflict. We know there's things like the peace fund now, but I think that has been one of the big questions surrounding the AU, right? Is if it's a it's a bit player in terms of resources compared to the United Nations or the European Union or the US. So how does it like even how does how does it make itself relevant? I think one of the answers is through AU I I'm not want I don't want to kind of uh, guess what you're going to say, but I think one of the one of the answers is through coordinating and convening roles through mechanisms like regional task forces. But I'd be curious as to kind of your perspectives on some of the financing challenges the AU faces and how that affects its role in, in broader kind of conflict management. And then we have sort of a, this other another question on um, uh, Again, I think one of the main re one of the main ways to your last point, Chris, that that all three of these missions, including the AURTF, have been criticized, has been kind of being overly focused on military strategies and not focused enough on prevention or preventative strategies and putting governing structures, institutions in place to fundamentally um, end some of the the conflicts and, and address kind of the 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 citizen security needs, the needs that people have not to be abused by armed actors, be they on government side or the rebel sort of side. And that, that's been one of the main, main I think, aspects of criticism of, 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 the, of, the, of the task forces, as well as I think to, to a lot of, of the approach to, to peace operations. So I'd be curious for all your, your takes on how to better integrate some of the military operations with some of the more governance and civilian components. Uh, Gita, why don't you, why don't we start with you, if you can address those questions, as well as any of the previous questions. Um, we'll go to, then we'll go to Chris, then we'll go to Betty, and then I'll offer some, some concluding remarks. Okay, thank you so much. Three sets of, quest, uh, of, of interventions from my side. I think in terms of thinking about the relationship and lessons between the RTF and, and, and the uh, intervention in Cabo Delgado, three things comes to mind. The first is that a political mandate is a precondition for deployment. And political mandate could be uh, a bilateral political agreement between states, it could be uh, agreement at the level of the regional economic community, uh, or it could be at the level of the African Union. What has happened over the last decade uh, is that there has been difficulties in trying to align these different levels of, the, of, of, of decision making. And I think that has also, it's reflected in some of the strategic reports on the review of, of Africa-led peace support operations that uh, I'm sure you're all aware of. The second, key lesson and in thinking about this is the is the mission support model uh, and I, I think we've not talked about this uh, today uh, the support model that informs how these missions are deployed and sustained um, it is primarily a national responsibility for funding the bulk of these ad hoc coalitions everything else in terms of providing support are often done bilaterally or limited support from uh, the African Union. And that leads me to the th uh, third point, which is around, uh, and it goes back to the last question that Nate made, what should be that alignment? I think a model is emerging where we are seeing a combination of uh, military interventions and stabilization operations. Uh, so if you look at the Lake Chad Basin today, you would find that uh, there is an ongoing military intervention, but in areas that have been cleared, uh, by uh, uh, the MNJTF 
uh, we are seeing development actors going there to support with community security, providing livelihood opportunities, and also provide basic, uh, providing basic infrastructure. I think increasingly, if we really want to ensure that we have sustainable peace, this model is one that has to be sustained. The last part of my intervention is around this alignment with the African standby force. I think the first important point is how we define the African standby force. If you are defining the African standby force as a standing force, which is located somewhere in Addis Ababa or elsewhere in Cameroon where you have the logistics base, then it does not exist. But if you're defining the African standby force in terms of capacity building provided, uh, to African forces over the last, say, uh, say since uh, almost 20 years, then we are seeing that elements of the African standby force are actually being deployed in ongoing operations. So if you think about the RTF, the model of the African capacity for immediate response to crisis and those who know the ACRIC, who, which was an interim measure pending the full operationalization of the African standby force is such that it is based on the RTF model. So you have forces that are agile, that can conduct rapid intervention over a limited period of time. So I do think that from all of these empirical uh, observations over the last 20 years, and maybe this is something that the African Center for Security Studies can help us take forward, we can actually become, we can tell a story, a narrative around the successes of Africa-led peace operations, but what needs to be done to achieve sustainable peace. And I think the part for that is stabilization. The part for that is ensuring governing, governance in, in borderland communities and, and giving people the agency to govern themselves. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Gide. Um, let's go to uh, Chris and then to Betty. Yes, thank you. I don't really have much to add, except uh, um, uh, Gide, you gave me something to think about. Um, it's encouraging what you said that there's some sort of development initiatives going on, um, you know, coming in from behind the, the multinational joint task force in the West African context. I, I haven't quite heard anything like that in, uh, in, the, in the RTF context, but that sort of got me thinking, like, let's say, for example, the RTF was still operational. All right. So it's been um, sort of defunct for several years now, but even while it was operational, the main countries where it was operating in Congo, CAR, and, and South Sudan, these are all countries that already have sizable UN peacekeeping forces in them, um, presumably carrying out all these other um, tasks, um, peace building and all sorts of other things that you're, you're suggesting, and probably providing some kind of coordination umbrella for NGOs and other, other actors that are providing services for ordinary people. So I wonder if that's something we could talk about at some stage is, um, you know, this, this comparison where you have the RTF operating in a, in, a, in a context full of countries that are already dealing with their own domestic conflicts, where you already have this, these giant UN missions that some, in some cases that have been there forever, like in DRC, that have contentious relationships with locals and the government. And then over there in West Africa, you don't have that kind of thing. Um, I wonder if that's something, that's a conversation we can have in the future. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in, in um, exploring that further. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, really, really interesting point um, about how having these missions really change the relationship between, there's no external, cutting the external out completely in terms of the UN or, or major intervention, I think really changes the, the conflict dynamics and the relationships between all the major parties to a conflict and some very, interesting and potentially in interesting ways that I think definitely merit uh, further discussion and conversation. Um, Betty, over to you for the last word. Uh, well, thank you. Um, wh well, basically what I wanted to say is that, uh, just repeat that there's no doubt that RTF had an impact in almost de debilitating uh, LRA. Uh, like I said, I promise I had uh, to send out to you my paper, which clearly demonstrates the reduction uh, of their activities um, in the region. But it's also very, it has a compelling uh, example for homegrown solution in that the four countries uh, contributed forces to address the problem. My question is, what if 
UN was not part of it? What if United States did not contribute the forces? What if U EU did not uh, contribute? What would it have uh, looked like in the absence of contribution by the institutions and the countries? The other thing I thought I would mention is that, um, yes, the question of prevention it was absolutely not, not factored into, in, into the intervention. It was just eliminate LRA and period. Not only that, Uganda had very active uh, kind of rehabilitation program, which was headed by a commission for amnesty. I have a lot of issues with that. But nevertheless, once the, the RTF uh, intervened, those who, whether they defected, whether they were captured, uh, that demobilization, that reintegration uh, exercise just was fizzled out. And therefore, up to today, we don't know what is happening to former LRA who were, uh, who returned after the RTF uh, intervention. The other thing too, I thought uh, RTF did not have any exit strategy. Uh, they basically what forced winding up the operation was they ran out of resources. And uh, as uh, Chris said earlier on, the US pulled off the plug and therefore uh, the forces could not continue anymore. And even then, uh, there hasn't been any deliberate effort to, to assess what happened after the, pull, after the forces pulled out of, of these countries. So these are hanging questions that could they have been, could it have been designed in a better manner uh, so that it had exit strategy and, uh, and take care of those who, and I think that was a very good thing that NGOs got involved and in encouraging defection, but thereafter, what happened to those who defected besides Dominic Owen who went to the Hague? Yeah, uh, basically, that's all I wanted to add. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Betty, and thank you, Chris, and thank you, Gide, for answering uh, our audience questions very, very insightfully. And a special thanks to those of you who managed to tune in to all three of these webinars. Um, I'd like to offer some concluding thoughts and kind of lay my, my cards on the table from having done three of these so far. So, so a little bit of a comparative lens here. So, so first of all, I think one of the two key things that emerged out to me from today's conversation are, despite the relative success of the AURTF model, um, there needs to be more, more, more efforts to focus on integrating the model with preventative strategies. So strategies that are use development aid or stabilization efforts to kind of um, address the underlying governance and development challenges in communities affected by conflict. I think that's a clear role that, that the AU, other regional actors and donors have to play going forward. Um, and second, we need to consider this, this, this issue of exit strategies that I think have been highlighted by all three of the panelists. Like to really consider, okay, at what point are these actors no longer a threat? At what point does it make sense sense to responsibly draw down peace operations if it makes sense to draw them down at all. So I, I think those all could be better, more, more, more considered in, in doing missions like this. That being said, um, I think that the AURTF and, and the ad hoc regional coalitions are quite under told um, success stories in African peacekeeping or peace operations more broadly. And I, I think there are a couple of reasons for this. There's a lot of skepticism. I think that they don't have the kind of funding. They don't receive the same kind of high profile attention of say missions like AMISOM or the UN and United Nations African Union mission in Darfur. But I would, I would argue that these missions have evolved very concretely to respond to very specific threats of security challenges that, and they do so very, very well. First, kind of as Chris laid out, what each of these missions have done is address a transnational security threat. Uh, a threat from an insurgent group that has somehow, be it the LRA, be it Boko Haram, be it um, AQM, has, 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 has spanned across border regions within countries and used that as a part of its strategy to survive. And we know that is what insurgents do. So in order to address that, what do you need? You need 
ways for states to coordinate with one another to address the cross-border spread of the insurgency. And this is a really, really powerful mechanism to do that. Having the AU come and say, we're going to provide you international legitimacy, we're going to provide a joint operations center, we're going to provide things like joint intelligence. Um, one of the things that was discussed in previous webinars was this right of hot pursuit, which basically allows uh, armies from varying countries to pursue these insurgent groups across borders. That's how you help attrit these groups when they're trying to exploit border regions. That's how you do it. Um, you don't need necessarily extra funding or a lot of extra funding or intervention. That's that's what you need. And and, and finally, I, I think you know to, to G Day's point, what it does is by by basically putting the onus on local actors, regional militaries to, to do the fighting, you're putting the regional actors in a coordinating and convening role, which is where they should be. Right, rather than necessarily a governing and, and directing kind of role. I think you get into problems when you do that. So I, I think for all of those reasons, um, this is a very, very promising model going forward. And I think one of the reasons why you're, you're seeing, even if they're not like AURTF, you're seeing definitely increased uh, ownership by uh, the states that are affected by conflict, be it you know the Rwanda's role in, in Mozambique or Sadat's role in Mozambique, there's a recognition that 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 regional actors, even if they don't necessarily have a lot of 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 funding and they don't necessarily have troops directly at their disposal, play a vital convening and coordinating role in managing cross-border insurgencies, which is as as Chris laid out, increasingly the type of insurgency we see in Africa today. Um, so thank you very, very much to all three of our panelists for, I think, highlighting all the wonderful challenges, successes, lessons learned from, from these missions. I hope that some of our colleagues in the African Union uh, listened and, and, and other regional organizations and part of African militaries or institutions and got something out of this discussion today. And, and I hope, you know, as, as, as I think all of our panelists have said, we can continue the conversation here at the Africa Center for how we can take lessons learned from African-led peace operations and apply them to African-led conflict management efforts uh, now and in the future. So thank you very, very much. And until next time.